Try this mic out, yeah? Turn it up. Michael Hutchins was the next king of rock and roll. Rock and roll, rock and roll. When Michael Hutchins died, he left behind more questions than answers. But he also left clues. Michael left hidden treasures. Michael was a bit of a pack rat almost, like he was, he had shit stored all over the world. In vaults in Zurich. In bunkers in London. In Bali. In LA. So it was almost like this detective thing. It's been a voyage of discovery trying to find all this. It, it has. Like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. In places you'd least expect. There's a vault in London with tapes in the place that Churchill ran the war. Loving glimpses. And... Tiger! Sure, Tiger. And revelations. He was actively having fertility treatment in the UK with Paula. Locked away for 20 years. These, we believe, are the last lyrics that he was writing. Yep, on yellow paper. They was left in his hotel room. He was writing right up until that evening. His last message. Sick of the towns and the window. Seems quite clear. Seems, you know, completely aware. You could say it's almost a suicide note. Who else has seen this? His diary. And I've held on to it for Tiger for many years. His innermost thoughts. As long as I feel like I've got my ear on the street, I'm not just, you know, living in a vacuum or something. Once I feel like that's happening, then I'm out of here. And the missing songs. 
Michael's brilliant final gift. The batch of songs fell between the cracks. The only place for him to be completely free was in the music. Oof, I got goosebumps. I certainly would like to be remembered in a good light. This might bring him peace, you know what I mean? And everybody else. Every component to this story now is the way it was meant to be. <laughs> the Michael Hutchins you saw was the Michael Hutchins you got. It's Michael. All the possibilities. When we started as a band, we were still in school, uh, very young, and probably spending too much time in music and not enough time on our studies. As far as influences are concerned for uh, songwriting, lyrics, and things like that, Sydney's the kind of place where I sort of end up writing love songs, as you can see. And uh, Melbourne, down below us, is uh, more artistic, dark and sleazy, so uh, a, a different, different feel altogether. So I need you. Michael Kelland Hutchins was never going to be an ordinary man. I'm just from the moment he was born, his half-sister, Tina, knew there was something special about her baby brother. With Michael, he had such a joy. I remember he'd wake up in the morning, even when he was a year old, and he'd pull himself up, and he'd rattle, like he was rattling a cage or something he'd be in his crib. And, but there was joy, he'd be laughing. Michael and his younger brother, Rhett, spent some of their early years in Hong Kong, where their dad, Kel, was working. He was a very shy, but lovely kid. Uh, welcome to uh, Fantastic Jack. Honestly, that junk. And he was just very warm, very tender, cuddly type. very gentle boy and when we moved to Hong Kong I suppose that started to bring him out of his cell a little bit. I noticed he loved writing poetry. He was a really happy child. And he was a happy adult. I had a feeling that he was going to be something. I mean, the first time I actually saw him perform live, we went into this dingy place. It was a big, big room and lots of beer flowing. I went back to see the boys and um, there was a, a pot smell about it. <laughs> I just thought it was funny. And then I, I was kind of worried because I thought, this looks like kind of a tough crowd out there. And Michael's kind of quiet. How does, what is going to happen? I was really concerned.
they came on and there was this metamorphosis. My quiet, spoken brother became this person on the stage that it just blew me away. I mean, he was all over the stage. He was owning it. He never wore contact lenses on stage because the thing he would pick out in the audience was the two people go yawning about it. And that was the thing. So he didn't want to see what the audience were re reacting to. He could only see the first three rows. Michael was blind as a bat, so, you know, he couldn't really <laughs> see the crowd. Michael didn't sing like anybody else. He didn't sound like anybody else. So it wasn't like you would listen to him sing and say, oh, he was influenced by so-and-so. Uh-uh. Michael's voice was Michael's voice. Don't ask me what you know is true. Don't have to tell you I love you Precious heart, I, I was standing, you were there, two worlds collided, and they could never tear us apart. He was like this true artist who happened to become incredibly commercial, but I think had a soul that was like a child. Peter Wilson, who would later star in the TV series La Femme Nikita, was an up and coming actress when she met Michael on an early In Excess video shoot. I was a pretty girl and he certainly liked pretty girls, but he had this tremendous capacity to make people feel completely at ease. They became lifelong friends. He had this fantastic old jag. He'd say, I'll meet you at 11, we'll be maybe 12, he'd get there. And you just go, you didn't know where you were going. Some lunch with someone amazing, and then you'd go to some other. It was just this adventure. It was like being with Pete Pan. Buying a Harley stopped you from becoming an asshole in a Porsche. Yeah, now I'm an asshole in a jag. When Mick Jagger came to Australia in the early 80s, it was Peter who introduced him to Michael. She'd modelled with Mick's girlfriend, Jerry Hall, and knew him well. I said to Mick, I said, oh, have you been to see In Excess? He says, no. I said, would you like to come and see them? Would you like to come and see us? It's a real treat. And um, he came. Michael came on the stage and did his thing, and I remember Nick pulling out a notebook. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm taking notes. I said, darling, he's doing you. He's doing you. He says, well, he's doing me a lot better than I do. Was the literally the front man, not for just a band, but for like I think a, a, a nation. Jump back, kiss myself. <laughs> Byron esque and you know George Jetson at the same time. He was just kind of like he was something from another, something from tomorrow. Billy Zane, one of the stars of Titanic, first met Michael in 1989. The actor was in Australia filming Dead Calm when they met. They formed an instant bond. He was a futurist, he was a sensualist, he was the, you know, the modern man, completely comfortable with his, 
masculinity, that he was, you know, his androgyny was allowed to flourish. Probably one of the most sensual human beings I've ever encountered. Everything was smell and taste and touch and sight, you know, and, and what he would hear. And I mean, he would just, he would take in life. Actress Leslie Ray Baker, who for several years was married to in excess drummer John Farris, was great friends with Michael. Our friendship was so obvious, we just, you know, we cared about each other. We loved each other. While touring with the band, she'd photograph him. Look at that. Great shot, right? Capturing intimate moments. I love this photograph. And his charm. Energy was coming off of him. And, you know, he had such beautiful movement, didn't he? And his cheekiness. And then here's what comes next. <laughs> <laughs> dumping water on everybody. <laughs> he had a, he did have a cheeky sense of humor. And he would do these crazy wild accents and, and he was funny. I mean, y you know that if you were hanging out with Michael, you get prepared to laugh a lot. That was a bad boy. <laughs> well, get them big old speed boats, put that big old engine on the back, put the sail to here, but put them on the bit of the cold ads, cook them up real fine down the Creole style. Let's take a big This is one of the lost songs Michael left behind. It has never been released. In 1997, Michael was collaborating with legendary LA music producer Danny Saber. Danny meant everything to him. Danny was helping him express everything he wanted to express. 20 years on, Danny has brought this song back to life. Definitely good. Finding Michael's music and the clues and treasures he left behind has been a two-year odyssey across four continents and five countries. Good evening. <laughs> Tucked away in a nondescript warehouse near Wembley in London, a battered but much-loved piano. It's just a little old piano. And Mike and, and, and Paul and, and Mike's friends and different musicians would, would sign the piano and tinker on the piano. And all the kids had been taught to play piano on the, on the piano. It's something that we can say is from a mum directly to Tiger. 
How about that? <laughs> In Zurich, under armed guard. The art Michael collected. And his guitars. I know that he loved musical instruments. He be, not necessarily because he was great at playing them but because he would get his friends to play them. I remember playing one of his guitars. He had a really great, a Gretsch semi-acoustic guitar. And we were just messing around with, he had a microphone and I was playing through an amp and we just about managed to get Voodoo Child happening live in, 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 in the living room. And he was singing and I was playing, and we really felt quite good about that. It wasn't the instruments, it wasn't the, the, the thing itself, it's what, you, what people could do with those things that made them important to him. OK. Rock did become a youth culture, and it became a kind of physical culture as well, very much a physical culture. And it's not just music, and never will be, you know, that's a fact. People, no one just buys a rock and roll record because of the song. He was a citizen of the world. Luggage warriors. <laughs> he knows the luggage warriors. Michael and I met in Hong Kong in 1986. I was working with uh, another Australian barrister who had previously acted for In Excess in Sydney. Yeah, have a night out. We had many nights out, many nights out. That meeting was the start of an unbreakable friendship, but the rock star and the lawyer were more than mates. Such was their bond, Michael wanted Colin Diamond to be the guardian of his daughter, Tiger Lily, if he and her mother, Paula, were ever to die. It's like reliving the whole memory again, Mark. It's shocking. It's to the heart. Colin was one of the executors of Michael's estate. He's never spoken publicly. Michael was an intriguing chap. He was extremely well-read and a real enigma for, for a rock star. Did he have an ego? Had a huge ego. Michael had a huge ego. <laughs> Mike treated the band as his brothers. In Excess was his family. Gary and Kim and John and Andrew and Kurt were Mike's brothers. And of course, most of his exceptional work occurred when he combined with Andrew Farris. Andrew being the melody writer and, uh, and Michael being the lyricist, and uh, he was amazed at Andrew's abilities. Sometimes I carry around a little dictaphone so I can sing melodies and things like that, especially when Andrew and I are writing. I suddenly go, ah, Eureka. When I met Michael and I realised how, you know, how clever he was, 
and, you know, and, and very good at articulating thoughts, ideas, you know, and clever with a lyric in a short space of time, I thought, why don't you do it? And also you're singing it, okay. so you're, uh, you know, you'll, you'll feel empowered to deliver it in, in, on a stage because you'll know what to oh, sing because you'll feel oh, it. You own the song. Oh, there's a been as big without in excess and could in excess have made it without Michael well you'd have to look at I think that they I mean okay if there was no in excess Michael needed a vehicle yeah. so that was the car he got in with the people in the car and that fucking car really knew how to go <laughs> Wembley Stadium was, was a good one. Thank God. He was a really great front man. He knew how to hold a crowd, how to take them somewhere else, and then suddenly how to punch them and make them and shock them. Hello, London! Is that what you say? Is it hello, England? Looks like England's out there. Fucking hell. The night I saw him, he had on black and white stretch pants. It's crazy. He was kicking ass and the girls were screaming and I was like, look at this cat go. Oh, he was a bad dude. Real live rock star. He was sort of the end of the generation of you actually had to be able to play fucking music and actually sing in tune. You had to have your natural dance moves. He didn't rehearse any of that stuff. That just came out of him. shows would finish, he'd want to keep it going. You know, he wanted to just keep it going and have a great time with everybody. He partied. An expert, you might say. Michael spent a dollar ten in every dollar he made. He was always the man that jumped up and threw his credit card across the table and paid for the night out. Were you ever taken back by the credit card bills? That... Oh, some of them were, were shocking, to say the least, you know. Well, I saw a bill came through for uh, $48,000 for a couple of days in New Orleans, and he did tell me what it was for, and he, he had a good time. He enjoyed himself. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me? Uh, no, I, 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 I couldn't break the confidence that Michael had uh, 
given in me, but he, he definitely enjoyed himself. Welcome to the strange party, baby. It's oh, not another kid. Oh, Jesus, friends, they fucking can't help themselves, can they? Mike was one of those few people that to get high with was was it wasn't depressing. It got like like to the point of like almost being disturbing sometimes. Nick Egan designed many of the album covers for In Excess. He and Michael were close friends. They worked hard and played harder. I've got um some answer machine messages that he left, and one of them would be like, he would come to town and he'd say, hey Nick, let's go shopping in a very sort of mock gay voice, you know, like we were two gay guys going out shopping together. Hello. Give us a call. Let's go shopping. He was in touch Sorry. with his feminine side, let's just put it that way. He said, do you like this on me? And I said, yeah, it looks great. You know, it's like, it's like having a girlfriend. Hi, Nick, it's Michael, how you doing? Um, just give me a call, it's, it's fine for you to stay at uh, my place if you want to. Um, that'd be great, mate. And then we'd go out, we'd go to parties, and we would get pretty fucked up, you know? I mean, I will say this about, and I'm not one to be saying, hey, drugs are great, but I had the best time on Michael. It was never this, I sit at home and get high and get paranoid. It's just go out and do stuff. And, and we went out and we did stuff and had a great time with him. And it was all kind of, you know, it was this ecstasy, we did uh, coke together, we did, you know, um, uh, what else did we do? I didn't really smoke weed, and, and I certainly didn't do heroin with him. But we went out to clubs, we went dancing. Let's kiss, <laughs> kiss, let's kiss. <laughs> so who's going to do the Michael Hutchins impersonation? You can do that. So yeah, nice. yeah, come on, look for the good bit. <laughs> when you talk that certain way. <laughs> love the look in your eyes. <laughs> Michael's substance abuse was always done in the most sort of up kind of let's have fun like it like it should be really, and it was really just there to sort of keep us going. First, you get the vodka, and then you uh, get a glass, put that in there, you put the tonic in, put half a glass of vodka, half a glass of vodka, one of these before the show every night. That's what we need. It was part of Michael's character, dangerous, cheeky. Come on. Mischievous. Elegantly wasted. Boy, boy, did he coin it and justify it. He made, you know, certainly made that. Okay, as long as he did it in a, you know, kind of sulk a smoking jacket and a monocle, everything was okay. <laughs> it was a night of debauchery. <laughs> it was in Paris. Um, I won't say his name, but it was a famous fashion designer that met up with us in a hotel and came with quite a number of friends and they had this big trunk. What's in the trunk? It was Pandora's box. <laughs> it was every recreational pharmaceutical fathomable to man. I mean, everything. Flash forward to uh, a couple hours later and we get a call from the hotel saying, you know, you're going to have to evacuate your room. The embassy's next door, and there's a terrorist on the roof dressed in black. And I looked around and I said, where's Michael? <laughs> <laughs> and I went out the window, Michael! <laughs> you very naughty boy! <laughs> Come down here at once! <laughs> Another day, another dollar. What can I say? It was fun. I'm the lead singer of Duran Duran. We, we had a massive female following in the 80s and into the 90s. But I remember going to an In Excess concert in London. And after the show, they had like a sort of a backstage bash. And the women in there were incredible. And 
They were just interested in Michael. I mean, he had an incredible sexual charisma. And it was extraordinary how eclipsed you could feel when you were around him. How would he flirt? Um, he'd flirt like their girlfriend. He'd be like their confidant. That was so interesting. You know, he was he was the girl in the bunk bed at the sleepover who's, you know, beckoning you upstairs to tell you secrets. I mean, I could, I could talk to him like he was my girlfriend. It was like, it was something so altogether fabulously, you know, inappropriate and right on mark. It was just like... <laughs> you know, it was it was it was like what the hell is this? You know, it was great. This is one of the last songs by Michael Hutchins. It's called. Temptation. You write a Harley Davidson. Every bloke Occasion. I know, in fact, quite a few ladies want to buy Harley Davidsons. Mm. Mm. What is the sort of buzz you get from a machine like that? There's a vibration between your legs. I, I've watched him seduce him. He was the master of that. Michael was a great lover, and he had a lot of girlfriends, and he did things that we could only fantomize about. He loved being loved. Lady killer. All he had to do was look at him. It was a done deal. Is it true that you've never been dumped by a girl? Uh, Is that true? No. Ooh, I, I think I was when I was about six, and that's the problem. He was almost like a woman in a way. He was so balanced, masculine and feminine. I think that's why so many women loved him. He had a, a way about him that was very feminine and feline. Sexy's androgynous serpentine. The way he moved. Charming could be. Super charming. <laughs> you know, everybody knows that Michael's very charming. This is the first time that Rosanna Crash has spoken publicly about her love affair with Michael. They met in Japan when she was modeling. Later, they fell in love and moved in together. In 1987, when in excess crisscrossed the states on their legendary kick tour. Rosanna was by his side. We had a lot of fun times, a lot of champagne, you know, a lot of fans going crazy. Look at them go, look at them kick. Makes you wanna have the other half live. Rosanna would often play saint to Michael's devil. If we stayed up all night somewhere, like, I'm the one who would make sure that we got to the next place. Such a hand, Mark. Basically, I felt like I was there to protect him and help him. Why did you feel you had to protect him? Because I don't think that Michael could protect himself. I, I, I just think he needed, like, support more than he got from people. In what way? They were using him? Just taking advantage of him, I would say. 
They were together for three years. Nothing bad to say about him. He was a great boyfriend. He's bad at breaking up, but he was a good boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. How was he bad at breaking up? Well, you know, he'll love you to the bitter end and then gone and you don't even, that's it. You know what I mean? But not tell you that. You know, like, oh, I'm gonna see you. And then, and then get a call, like, you know, after the flights arrive to where you're living together and tell you we're not together anymore. And go like, wow, <laughs> really? <laughs> you know? Nicola, you never answer the phone. Can't believe it. Anyway, um, it's me, Kylie. Um, so we were thinking of having lunch. So call Michael and he'll organize it. But I really must speak to you today. So uh, I'll speak to you later on. Bye. After Michael left Rosanna Crash, he began dating Kylie Minogue, whose reputation until then had been squeaky clean. And she'd had enough of that. Suddenly, she doesn't want that clean-cut image anymore. She wants to get out and have a good time. And so what better way than to get in bed with uh, Australia's most outrageous rock star? I mean, that, you know, if you're going to do something, you might as well do it properly. And that certainly was, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. You chuck Jason Donovan out, and you bring in Michael Hutchinson. Talk about chalk and cheese. This was a bit of a shock thing, you know, from Jason Donovan to Michael Hutchins. I think people are going to be a bit shocked. <laughs> 21 years old, and we collided at that time. <laughs> he definitely corrupted her. <laughs> I, I found this new confidence, and I, I was just very eager to, to explore that. And, and also, I can look back on it and think that it was, it was rebelling in a, in a kind of childish way against everything that I had been made to do before. I mean, he was uber, uber famous. He's an icon already, and he believed in me. And it was a time when so many people did, and it's getting me very much. <laughs> I love him. I still love him. It's hard for me. I mean, I look at, I have things from him, and I, I see them sometimes, and I sometimes have to put them away. I don't, you know, it took me a long time to listen to his music again, you know. I still have dreams about him. It was like a big part of my life at that time, you know, and, and for him to be gone, um, I don't look hurt. Just, you know, it hurts. He was just, for all of the people that got to meet him and got to know him, you were forever touched by him. You know, it wouldn't matter where you were, you get a phone call out of the blue. Oh, I'm, where are you? Oh, I mean, I just thought maybe you'd be around or... He was always like that. He'd sort of come and go, but he was never gone. When Michael looked at you and spoke with you, he somehow, some way, bypassed the guards and the windows to your soul. He just would get in. The last time I was here was uh, in 96. <laughs> you make some friends in your life. Usually because they make you laugh. <laughs> and we were very good at making each other laugh. In the early 90s, Michael Hutchins was searching for new music. Music he could write and record independently of in excess.
Michael turned to Andy Gill, guitarist and singer in the English band Gang of Four. They shared a mutual friend, Bono. He rang me just out of the blue. He just, he just phoned me up and said, did I want to play some guitar on his solo work? And I said, sure, I'd love to, you know. And then 10 minutes later, he ran back and said, actually, what I meant to say was, can you come and write an album with me? <laughs> you know, I came to realise that that was sort of classic. It's that sort of lack of confidence to say, will you do this? And then you go, yeah. It was also a brilliant strategy. <laughs> and, I mean, he, it, disarming is the word, because he can take the weapon out of your hand. I always think that God reserves the lisp for truly dangerous people. <laughs> you know, he just had that, so nobody, you know, he just, when he talked, he had this kind of, it was so, you just, you just, you, you couldn't but fall for that vulnerability, that lisp, like him and Mike Tyson. Hi, this is Michael Hutchins of In Excess, reminding you to watch Simply Living on Channel 7. I mean, I just find it very attractive, but it's always thinking, whoa. He's a dangerous man. He was just quite chuffed that Bono thought he was the real deal, the real deal. He'd wrap that Irish twang in Bono's and say, you know, he thinks I'm the real deal, Carl. Even though Michael would tell you that he's, he was very insecure as a singer, he, he was a, a truly great singer. And he must have known that somewhere in amongst his insecurity. I used to say to him, you know, for a performer, insecurity is your best security. <laughs> and the really dull performers are the, are the ones that are so self-confident, they don't give a shit about what's going on in the crowd. But he was a really great singer, and I think this is a great singing record that you made with him. Highly dangerous tweeter vocal. <laughs> For nearly 20 years, the tapes of the music that Michael recorded have lain undisturbed in a London vault. Now his music is being heard again. Stored in London, much of it made in France at Michael's villa. You put your heart with trust into my hands. I am so tight, kept you protected from pain. Did you ever think about it? Yeah, this was it. This was the one. This is where we, 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 we wrote all the music. So my, my setup was here. Computer, keyboard, and Michael would sit on the bed singing. There's a great picture of, uh, of, of me with all my gear and Michael going, you know, like that. You know, I just record everything he did. To begin with, it was always kind of not, not real words, sort of sound alike things, just to get the, just to get a feel, just to get the, just, just to try and get, try and get the beginning of the idea of what it was going to be. So babies come up. If it started going somewhere, then there'd be like a sort of getting lyrics going. Back then, I remember calling him, him up and he was working on some solo stuff. I said, you all right, mate, you know? Are you okay? Because this stuff looks pretty crazy to me, you know? Was he tricky to to record? It was it was easy. I mean, the only times um, 
sometimes I over directed and uh, you know it's like oh no no Michael you've got to hit it you know no 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 you've got to go softer on on that and he's Andy fuck off <laughs> <laughs> let me get on with it. What happens here? It's the end of the song. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I remember the Sunday afternoon, Bono ringing up, going, "Come on, guys, come down. We're having a, you know, having a party here. Johnny Depp's just set his shirt on fire, and come and help us out." And Michael and I looked at each other, and he went, "This sounds like a lot of fun." And you <laughs> were saying to me, "We need reinforcements." Down in our place, with Edge and myself's places, he would, he'd climb over the gates and just arrive and, you know, midnight, and say, you know, anything going on? You know, people talk about my favorite year. Well, that kind of was, that was definitely my favorite summer. I mean, it was, it was really good fun. <clears throat> it was a little bit naughty. We did quite a few naughty things. <laughs> we were absolutely plastered for half the time. He liked having fun. He liked girls. He liked drugs. He liked partying. Um, pretty much all the things that I liked as well. Um, and we didn't compete with each other. And that's, that was the most important part of it, was that I didn't feel that I had to compete with... with Michael Hutchins, and I don't think he felt that he had to compete with Simon Le Bon. You know, it was, we, we were just on a level with each other, and we became mates. Michael's French villa was his retreat. Many a family Christmas was spent here. Christmas came with a new present. And then Michael skips from Lay. <laughs> Kylie, oh. the next minute, turning up with uh, the biggest, one of the biggest supermodels in the world. Yes. Yes. Helena was, I think, a little nervous. She was only 21. You know, she was a kid. Was yeah. yeah. Helena was great. She was good because she didn't sort of you know, she didn't take any shit from Michael, kind of thing. They were the most beautiful couple in the south of France. Well, what can we say? Michael and I are having a groovy time with the French people on a Friday night, and that's it, I guess. And um, don't wake us up too early, OK? Bye. In summer, as Michael and Andy worked in the room above the pool, down below, Helena would work on her tan, wearing even less than this. Helena would pop round, get her kit off, and have a bit of a sunbathe. So obviously, I would, you know, not look. <laughs> My favourite memories of him out of France, if you stayed up late enough, Michael would strip naked and be in the pool and um, and then serve you breakfast. <laughs> he 
he was very into his garden. The olive trees were his pride and joy, I think. And he was getting the olives, having them pressed and bottled, and Helena was making labels for them. It's things that you don't think of them doing, right? That's why they like to do them. And they did really ordinary things together. You know, like they'd go shopping to the market and they'd find great food and then they'd take it back to the house and they'd cook together. I mean, he was, he really loved cooking. He loved cooking. Drawings on the barbie. Nighttime brought new adventures. One night, Michael arrived home with the boys. They'd all been out to all the nightclubs in Nice. And everybody else had gone to bed, but Michael was up and he couldn't sleep. So he woke me up and he said, I've got an idea. Let's go see grass. Well, it was three in the morning. The sun is not even beginning to come up, Wayne. <laughs> grass is a nearby town, famous throughout France for its perfume and flowers. There's Tina. <laughs> And we were driving on our way to grass. And he stopped on the side of the road, got out, and I followed him. There he is. Wins again. <laughs> Thank you. And he said, that place down there is where they make the perfumes. This is where they grow all the flowers for all the perfume in the world. Grass. Here, right here. Mm -hmm. right here. Yeah. Lavender, like my house. Mm -hmm. Lavender I showed you. Mm -hmm. All around here. And he started to tell me the story the story Michael began telling was of the fictional 18th century serial killer known as the French perfumer. He is the greatest perfumer in all of the world. And then one day he's standing there and he goes, he smells the smell. It smells like peaches and it smells like girl, but it smells like something he has no idea of. He's catalogued every single scent, a million scents. He follows the smell across the left bank onto the right bank in Paris comes to a window. It's a young virgin girl, about 14 or 15, eating peaches. He looks at her. He has never smelled anything like her. And so he goes to the window and he grabs her and kills her while he's smelling her. Oh. And she dies. I would say, oh, really? Well, he'd say, yeah. And then he goes about the task of making her into a perfume. <laughs> He does it for 20 years. <laughs> he makes 20 perfumes out of 20 virgins. Until he's the most notorious murderer in the world. He was so animated, but that's the way he was when he told stories. They catch him, and they're going to behead him. He says, I have one last witch. Give me my back. And he put all the perfumes into one. And he goes, this perfume comes out across Paris. The whole city turns into an orgy and they fuck him to death and kill him. <laughs> they tear him apart. No one indulged his senses and enjoyed being sensual more than Michael. And the tragedy was that at the age of 32, a random act of violence changed his life. He and Helena were walking through uh, Copenhagen. Uh, they'd just picked up some takeaway, and Michael was walking across the street, and he wasn't moving fast enough for a cab driver. The guy got mad and came over and punched Michael, and he landed on the corner of a curb with the back of his head. He was knocked out. He hit the curb and it, his brain rotated inside his skull and it severed the nerves, which um, the olfactory nerves. So he lost his sense of smell. He lost the sense of smell and taste, which was devastating to him. You can't even taste water. You can't smell a flower. It, it, it saddened him greatly. A sea urchin. It's delicious. Carefully. <laughs> yeah, if you can't taste anything, it's almost what's the point? 
The man who was all about taste and t touching and, and, and smelling, and they had that taken away from him. Food, a fine wine and whatever was very important to him. You know, the smell of the scent of a woman. He also said he can't experience his girlfriend the way he could before. How did it change him? Wow. Um... I think it... It injured a part of his life force. He, he did change. He became far more aggressive and more easily provoked to emotion. After the accident, the highs was, were lower and the lows were deeper. But he was managing it. He'd have his friends describe what a wine was tasting like. We'd get some wine and he'd get me to describe what it was like. And I'd go, uh, well, there's a bit of uh, forest floor, a uh, touch of iodine, and there's maybe a tiny bit of pencil lead. You know, go, oh, yeah, I bet that's good, yeah. I think around that period, too, we were, you know, we were noticing that our following was starting to uh, to l sort of lessen, you know. Um, it's just a natural thing. Um, so I think, I think he may have, more than any of us, struggled a little bit with that, that sort of thought that, gee, we're not, you know, we're not the biggest band in the world anymore sort of thing. As long as I feel like I've got my ear on the street and I know what's going on and I'm not just, you know, living in a vacuum or something, once that I feel like that's happening, then I'm out of here. I don't want to take any space up. There's lots of great people coming up. They, they can take my slot. That's why he sort of initially chose to live in, in London. And, you know, a lot of the time he thrived on it. But then it just, I guess, started to kind of backfire. Mm. I, I think there was a certain element of Michael that felt that he would always uh, get through it and come out on top in the end, you know? And I, I think that there was, that there was just certain elements of his life that he couldn't get on top of, and that's what really bugged him. In his diary, Michael wrote this. I've still got questions, and they're the big ones too. I know I'm not alone. A kiss to celebrate New Year, but Michael and Helena's relationship was not to last. In October 1994, Michael was interviewed by Paula Yates, who asked him about Helena. And do you think you're going to get married? Uh, what? Do you think no. you'll get married? <laughs> no, no. Why no. not? We're happily unmarried. Are you? Mm. Why don't you fancy getting married then? I just, we wants, because everyone wants us to get married. I don't. I know, except for you. <laughs> oh, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Terrible idea. She's yeah. got to Soon after, yeah. they oh, began yeah. an affair. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, Paula was married to Irish rock star Bob Geldof, with whom she'd had three daughters. Now, uh, Paula has been a fan of yours for a long time, hasn't she, Michael? I think she has, actually, yes. <laughs> Even while she was married to someone else, was she a fan of yours? Yeah, oh, if you've ever seen The Tube in my first interview <laughs> on The Tube, and, and what happened? Were you all uh, flirting it's outrageously inevitable what with each other? Happened, actually. <laughs> it's inevitable. Now, in all the um, the polls that I was reading in Countdown magazine, mm. Mm -hmm. 
you know, when it came to sexiest man, mm. you won. Is there a category for that? Yeah. Sexiest I don't man. Really think now, what... And she was flirting out right just Yes, well, she is a good flirt. But, uh, boy, she likes me. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. I call it love. Oh, he adored her. Adored her to the end. He thought that she was the most interesting person that he'd ever, ever met in his life. Flirting was an art form for, for, for Paula. Were well, you always very forward? Am I forward? Well, a bit. And you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> They'd always be laughing. He, he just thought that she was the, the ant's pants. Paula intellectually stimulated Michael. She, she challenged him intellectually and just psychologically in a lot of ways. I think she, she really gave him a run for his money. To be honest, I thought the rest of the world, including Australia, lost a little respect for Michael when he went with Kylie because Kylie was a bit of a joke. But then when he went with Helena, it went back up again. But then with Paula, it was so in the media. Michael was shocked when he got back that from it. He couldn't believe it. He was terrorised, absolutely terrorised by the media. Imagine you're having dinner with somebody and the entire conversation has been taped. He and Paula were in a restaurant somewhere in quite a full dining room and, and at some point he realised that everybody else in there was a journalist. They paid off the, the hotel to not have... Uh, music. I kept on saying, why is there no music? <laughs> um, and they're taping it, and then as you get up, people start coming at you, and like ghouls. When he began the relationship with Paula, he'd never hit a press that was hostile towards him before. They hounded him. The paparazzi thing about him being involved with Paul Yates, who was at the time married to Bob Gilloff, was so intense. Opening up the, the front door in Redburn Street and, and having hundreds of photographers. See you later, baby. Literally prepared to injure themselves just to try and get a shot. When you drive with him, he'd sit sideways. He'd always sit there as a passenger looking to the right. Why? Because any press had become along, take a photograph of Mike on the side. Okay. They made Michael and Paula's life hell. They really did. Think they got the picture, but they don't really know. I'm With standing on the rooftop, I, I think he's, he, he did feel under attack. Maybe he was a little bit paranoid, but he felt everybody was, was kind of going for him. You know, the press always have to have a good guy and a bad guy. And Bob was never going to be the bad guy. Hey, where's Paula? Yeah. Are you worried about today or quite confident? Do you want to put that in the boot? Paula. Paula is a, a woman um, to those that do know her and not to those who read about her, um, has had to pay enormous price for leaving St. Bob for me. In London, that, as an Australian, uh, I think that is considered bad form. What had he done wrong? He said to me, what does it matter who I go out with? Paula, 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 Paula. You know, I've seen the photographers at a distance push Pixie, who's six years old, over to make a cry and take a photograph and then print a front page headline, Life with Paula and Michael for Pixie. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's what you read. The press intrusion troubled Michael. 
not least because of the effect it was having on Paula's daughters. You can see in his, in his diary there's a reference there of why should Paula's children suffer uh, by going to school because of the relationship that he was having. This is what Michael wrote. The price we have always paid for freedom of the press from certain parts of the media is truth. There is much more grief to children having to defend their own mother at school because of this cartoon character assassination being trumpeted by the journos. How can they get it so wrong? That's what is totally shocking. It's expensive to punch photographers, I found out. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on a 12-month bond for GBH, so there'll be no punching. <laughs> the paparazzi made their life so miserable that it, it started to affect their relationship a lot because Michael felt he had to get out of London. You know, he hated London, absolutely hated London. Like Diana said just before she died, if I could, I'd leave this country. Any sane person would. Because there's nothing I do that works. Only the negatives are blown out of proportion and the positives are destroyed. A heavenly Hiranian tiger lily. She was uh, a, a real gift from God. I mean, it's fantastic. I'm on cloud nine, you know, what can I say? It's something that becomes about more than you, doesn't it? Tiger was the, the center of his universe. It was Michael's future. Tiger! Tiger! <laughs> Do you feel that the time's approaching for you when you'd like to be a dad? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Soonish. <laughs> yeah, I'd like that very much. On the 22nd of July, 1996, Michael became a father. He was so, oh, just so happy to have a baby girl and so happy to be that I just think that, he, I don't know that he knew how to do it all. He'd been a rock star all his life, you know? I think he was trying to find some level of balance. She's extremely happy, Michael's extremely happy, the baby's really well. They're obviously both, you know, exhilarated at the birth of their new child. Can you tell us why she chose to have the baby at home? She thinks she wanted a more natural, relaxing setting. Have they chosen a name for the baby yet? Yes, the baby's name is Heavenly Hirani Tiger Lily Hutchins. And uh, how is Michael feeling at this present moment? Exhilarated as any new dad is. It's his first child and he's over the moon. These photos are from Colin Diamond's private collection. Michael gave them to him. There's some wonderful shots in here. This is memory lane for me. These are real treasures. Yeah, they are. They are. They've been in my vault, you know. These are these are private shots. This is what I kept so Tiger would know, you know, in reality. You're like one looks worth a thousand words. So when she sees these photos, she'll understand how much she was loved. But honestly, it's my first baby and she's just perfect. I mean, I can't believe it. He was so thinking proud of her. Any time, night or day, bring the friends in and say, look. Look at my tiger. And Paula's so proud how, how she's, what she's given to the man, you know? Look at that proud look in her eye. Look what I've done for you, Mike. The first question you get, got asked is, now you've got a baby, you know, is it gonna change your life? And he even said, you know, I don't believe in this doom and gloom thing of having a kid. He goes, the hours are the same. <laughs> He really wanted to be a parent. He saw himself as 
not as a dead end, but as 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 as, as you know, part of a a chain, a family chain. So he was very, very, very proud and happy, and fulfilled to become a father. Really? It's like being a new dad, Michael. What's it like being a dad for the best? Ah, it's, um, it's beautiful. I mean, it's fantastic. I'm on cloud nine, you know, what can I say? The first time he showed me, he arrived in L.A. He had photographs for me of little Tiger. He said, you know, I can't, I can't smell her. That just broke my heart. He said to me one day, he said, you know, Simon, I'll never be able to smell my baby, which is, which, which is a very sad thing. I'm pretty good at it, surprisingly. <laughs> what, being a, being a dad? Being a dad, yeah, I love it. Everyone who knew Michael says he adored Tiger Lily. In his diary, he wrote this poem for her, ending with the lines, Tiger, Tiger, sleep for a while. And when you wake up, just give us a smile. Wow. You see how much he loved her. I went past his bedroom one night. He had a cradled on his, on his chest, sort of like as a, as a, as a lady would, you know, and, and you know, she was suckling into his shoulder and he was just cuddling. And, I looked sideways at him and I had the big, big, a big grin for him because he just looked aside and he couldn't move because the, because Tiger would have woke her and he was just like, how long do I have to do this for? <laughs> I said, you're in for the long haul, brother. <laughs> he, lo he loved being a, uh, being a father to, to Paula's kids and a father to his own. Look at this one here with, with little little peaches. God rest her soul. Look at her like a little mouse. Look at how much the girls loved her, and they and they continued to get you know with her as the sisters. They got to spend some time with her that the mum and uh, Paula and Mike didn't. She's the light of his life. At least he had some time with her, eh? Even though it was short and brief. It was very intense and, 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 and full of happiness. It changed him. Changed him for the better. He had different goals and pure contentment. And uh, we didn't realise it was going to be robbed away from him so quickly. Life is precious, isn't it? Some people have it. Whatever it is, they have it. And Michael had it. The shoot that I did in 1993, that shoot was, to this day, if you ask me what my top five favorite shoots are, that's in the top five. He knew who he was, and he was comfortable in it. You can see that in the photos. You can see when I'm asking him to do something. That's to take your shirt off. Like, George Michael would never do a picture of him taking his shirt off, but Michael would just do that. It would be like no big deal to him, and he was just confident. I've been shooting music for 40 years. I think it's the most iconic photo session of Michael Hutchins. But every time I was around him or I saw him, he always had a beautiful girl with him. The whole story, and which is the truth, about the mask thing I did with him, with the fetish mask, was I knew through friends that he was a bit kinky about sex, and I know he liked sex. So we did the regular setups, and at the end I said, hey, Michael, what do you think about wearing one of these for one of the shots? And he looked at me and he just 
smiled and laughed, and he, and he said, yeah, I'd love to. And he put them on, and I shot this, he was smoking his cigarette, and I just shot him wearing these masks. They're my favorite pictures of Michael because of that moment. But a lot of people tell me all the time, like, no, you can't see him too much. You can't see enough of him. And I'm like, yeah, but that's, you can see his eyes, and that's all that matters to me. Like I said, he, he had it. So you, when you have it, you don't have to work it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You've got it. In the mid-90s, the pressures piling up on Michael coincided with the dip in popularity of In Excess. At the 1996 Brit Awards, he was humiliated by people he thought were his friends. Michael was giving an award to Oasis. And the winner is the best video, Oasis Wonderwall. Got no say except for I'm extremely rich and you lot aren't. <laughs> and I'm not even in it. As beans shouldn't present fucking awards to gonna be. Has-beens fucking shouldn't be giving gonna be's awards, right? And the next day we got to the studio and I saw Michael and uh, said, "Hey, go, hey, buddy, I go, hey, how's been? How's it going?" And he and he just his head just dropped. It was like the air. And I and I, I, I was like, "Come on, man, you can't give a shit about that," you know. But it did. It, it hurt him. It hurt. I don't care what you say. Every step I take. Mike, I think, was also frustrated by the, the what he felt was the slow demise of the band. The band wasn't selling records the way they had done. He was very concerned. I had a lot of conversations on the phone with Mike where um, the crowds were, you know, 2,000 people, and he'd, he'd refer to that as some um, ritual humiliation. We all have our wilderness years, whether it's drugs, alcohol, lack of fame, whatever. His worst nightmare was to become a caricature of himself. And because of all the stuff that was happening in the press, he was becoming more famous for being famous. And people were, were, start, were losing sight of why he was famous in the first place. And that's what the music he was working on outside of In Excess was really what I think he was striving for. Zip, click, tear away. Ha! You got too much friction. He wanted to move on from, from In Excess. And he was trying to figure out who the fuck he was. He was discovering his own sound. He was growing as an artist. You got nothing to prove. But he couldn't get through to the band. That's when we lost him. Excess has just about done everything. You've, you've taken up all the challenges. Mm. What's left to keep you in the band? Exactly. See ya. <laughs> oh, you my life again. In 1997, Michael made several trips to Los Angeles to write and record with music producer Danny Saber. Again. He never wanted to be disloyal to an excess. But Michael did want to be true to himself and create music he considered his own. You know, he wasn't leaving the band. He wasn't uh, upset with his mates. He loved making music with them, and, and their music had its own sound. But he was discovering his own sound. He was growing as an artist. And he was trying to figure out who the fuck he was. Even though, to me or to anybody looking at him, it's like, man, you're fucking Michael Hutchins, dude, you know? You got nothing to prove. But 
If one's own self-confidence gets shaken, it's hard to get it back. My opinion, he wanted to move on from, from in excess. And, and, you know, and he, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about that, that kind of stuff. He needed to change the music. He so desperately wanted new music. But he said to me, you know, and he said more than once, you know, the band are just happy to sit on their farms in Australia. They don't want to hear new stuff. They don't want to move on from the 80s. And it was so troubling to him because he knew he would be irrelevant if he continued on that track. But he couldn't get through to the band. The band was like family for him. So I think trying to break out on his own was always going to be challenging. It's almost like trying to break up with a girlfriend that doesn't want to let you go. We can do it like this. Let's do okay. it in sections, you okay. know? Yeah. Okay. Want we'll to start there? Yeah, let's start with this bit. Where he was at in his life, Perhaps the only place for him to be completely free was in the music. I won't look back. Won't look back. Yeah. In that music and doing that record with Danny, his own voice. All his days are gone. So of grunge music takes his own life. Seattle's Kurt Cobain is dead of an apparent suicide. I remember getting a, a call from Michael. Kurt Cobain had just passed away. And Michael, he began to weep. He's, he's the poet laureate of our time. How could we lose someone like that, like this? He loved Cobain's music. It hit him hard because this is what he wanted to get to. I remember lying on a beach with him and he was talking about Kurt Cobain. And he turned to me and he said, you know, if, if Kurt just had a chance to just be up late at night and be hanging out with his mates like we're hanging out and just you know, you know, swimming in the sea and making mischief, he'd still be here. And I said, you think, Michael? He said, yeah. He says, that, that thing, that weight, it just, it lo you lose all your sense of humor, you know? And, um, and Kurt was really funny, I think. And I said, well, I don't know. I, I don't know that about Kurt, but, but um, I know it about you. You're a funny fucker. And he laughed his head off. And so it's when, he'd run, when he ran out of that, whatever you might call it, uh, frothy, fun-loving side of his life, when he, when he lost that joy, I think that's when, the, that's when we lost him. I think Tiger Lily was everything to Michael. Huh. He was heading home. That's where the conflict came. Now you have something that's so much more important than anything else in front of you. Wow. <laughs> that was a bit exciting, wasn't it? <laughs>
Michael had it all. He was a great looking guy. He had great physicality. Really one of the great performers, I think, ever in rock. After the birth of Tiger Lily, Michael's priorities changed. He'd been a, a Peter Pan all of his life, and now that he's had a child, and it's like, I just want to put the brakes on so I can settle a little. In his diary, Michael wrote, conflict equals human weakness. Strength equals human greatness. But the conflict in his life was intensifying. Stop, 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 stop. 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 In May 1996, Paula and Bob divorced. It appeared amicable. But four months later, while Paula was overseas, police raided the home she now shared with Michael. Paula flew straight back to England. Just come back to fight with my children. I've had to leave Tiger behind in Australia with her dad and her grandparents, which obviously I didn't want to do, but she wasn't feeling very well. Paula suspected Bob had had a hand in what had happened. Um, as for the so-called investigative report in, this, in the mirror, um, the police haven't even asked to speak to me yet, so I can't comment on that. I think suffice to say there's an entirely different way of looking at this whole series of events. I think we've had live aid and now we're getting live aid. As the bitter custody battle between Paula and Bob played out, Michael turned to Colin Diamond for advice. My message to him was, we'll, we'll sort it out, mate. It'll be OK. Don't panic. Don't, don't panic. The conflict and the constant press intrusion affected Michael greatly. Later that year, while on a trip away, Michael wrote this in his diary. CD. Cold Diamond, just want to get home to Paula and carry the baby. Sorry, I have no comment. What's the no comment refer to? No comment regards to the press, because I would have told him, don't, don't make any comments, the matter's before the court. You know, he would have rung me to say, what do I say when I go through customs? And I'd say, just, you want to get home to Paula? That's your words. My words is no comment. So he said, sorry, I have no comment. You know, the thing with Paula and Bob and all that was pulling at him just dramatically. You know, it was a lot of stress. It was really wearing him down because, you know, he had just had a child. I think Tiger Lily was everything to Michael. He talked incessantly about her. It was almost like everything else that you think is important when you're young fades away because now you have something that's so much more important than anything else in front of you. This is video that Michael shot. This is the first time it's been shown. What like that? <laughs> hey, sweetie. What you doing? What you doing? What you doing? What you doing? Oh, what's that? It was such a conundrum. It was a, a, a terrible problem. His child was living in a city that he was so uncomfortable in. You want to sit up? I'm here, baby. You're busy. Yes, mummy. Busy. No, hello, darling. Here's our beautiful bedroom. With the sausages dancing on the ceiling. I mean, bacon dancing. Aussie flag. Um, tiger! Tiger! He said, I'd, well, I'd like to bring her up in Australia. He said, you know, Australia's so down to earth. She could, you know, a great Aussie kid. That's what I want. 
And um, I said, that would be wonderful. And I didn't want to bring up again, that's another city. His plan was to spend about six months a year here and about six months in London. That was the plan we were working towards. Mike was an Australian. He was heading home. But that was easier said than done. I asked him, what are you going to do? Tiger is with Paula. Paula has her three girls. And of course, that, that's where the conflict came because Bob was, was obviously wanting to have reasonable 50% access and there was no way Paula would have gone to Australia without the girls. And that was something that needed to be nego you know, negotiated out. He said, well, maybe we can work something out because I need my baby close to me. Are you sitting up now? You are, aren't you? And your girl can sit up. Yeah. La 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 <laughs> That was a bit exciting, wasn't it? <laughs> Come in. Come on. Up you get. Up you get. Give me a hand. Oh, yes. There we go. Look at that. What a grown-up guy. <laughs> Amazing. He's in his prime. This place was packed. The superstar of that night was the great Michael Hutchins. I was standing next to the king. That was his last gig. It was a darker Michael. He had a plan to split up a poor. Some war. You know, the call with Bob. I just don't talk about those things. Angry. Saint Bob. Disappointed, lonely. I don't think he was suicidal. Sick of the dogs outside my window. The international music industry is in shock with the death of rock star Michael Hutchins. I think this is the biggest unanswered question in rock and roll, to be honest. It's shocking and unbelievable. Michael is dead. We'll never see him again. It wasn't his time to go. Under curious circumstances. Nobody asked the real story. Only Michael knows. Yeah, that is heavy. Then there's the music. It's going to be big. What you have is something that nobody else has. I got goosebumps. He really wanted his music to be heard. It's really good. Beautiful ending. He just touched the souls of so many people. He's going to write the final chapter. Michael was the last rock star. Make a